Hello, Honest Pod people. Welcome back to the show. Okay, I have been listening. I've gotten really into podcasts. You know, I'm not a super podcast listener. I have not ever really been that person. And lately, because I've been having to drive quite a bit, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts. And I don't really know why I'm telling you this other than the fact that like, you know, I think we have a fairly good podcast here. I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty proud of us guys. I feel like we talk about some good things. We've had some good interviews. I'm pretty proud of us. So with all that being said, if you enjoy this podcast at all, in any shape or form, I'm going to ask that you do two things for me. If you've not already done it, I'm going to ask that you review this podcast. Well, actually, I'm going to ask three things. I'm going to ask that you subscribe and then that you would review this podcast. It really does mean a lot. It really goes a long way with the whole podcast world. And then I'm going to ask something even crazier. Would you share this with people? Would you share on your social medias? I always put a clip on my social media on Carrie Scott Garcia on Instagram and usually Facebook. Um, like a clip from the podcast, would you be willing to share it or even go, you can go to, you know, if you're listening on Spotify or whatever, and you can actually press the share button and it will give you your social media to share with, um, to share that episode. That would mean so much to me. And I would love for more and more people to get to hear about what we're talking about over here. Cause here's what I think we're talking about. That's unique. I think we're really just talking about, honest places in our story where we are either stuck or frustrated or really don't have clarity. And we're also talking about how God redeems a story and what comes out of that. Like we aren't just doing all of this work so that we can just know more about ourselves. That's a part of it. And so that we can heal, that's a part of it. But it's also so that we can go out and help others heal. And I think there's just real goodness for people to, that they can find themselves somewhere in this, uh, when they're listening to this, in this place, in this story. Um, So there's that. And I would really appreciate that. I am coming off of a wild weekend. We did, for the first time ever, we did an online Freedom Academy. So for those of you that don't know what Freedom Academy is, Freedom Academy is a three-day intensive training where we help you heal in your story and give you tools to help others heal in theirs. It's like 50% personal development because you really can't take people farther than you're willing to go yourself. Um, And it's like 50% leadership development, which most of you would say, well, I'm not a leader, so I don't go. And here's my question. Do you love anyone? Because if you love people, then you're leading people. So really that doesn't fit to say you're not a leader. Of course, you're leading someone. People are watching you, whether it's at your workplace or in your home with your kids or, you know, in your church, within your family, they're watching you. And so we want to give you the skill sets to be able to hold stories of pain, which everyone has well. And we do that by helping you understand your own story. So anyway, we do that in person. We've been doing that in person for years now. If you want to come to Freedom Academy in person, we have another one coming up in September. Uh, We'll put that in the show notes. You can um, sign up for Freedom Academy. But we happen to do one in person. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about this because I did not want to do it. I did not want to do an online Freedom Academy. And we just hired um, a sweet girl. Her name is Tori Hine. Maybe you know of her. She's awesome. And she's our uh, executive director of strategy and marketing, and she's phenomenal. And she pushed really hard for this. Now, this is risky for her, right? Because she's coming into a new space. And this is actually, you know, some of what I want to encourage you with. Um, She's coming into a new space with someone, two people, me and Juliana, who have run Freedom Movement for almost 10 years now. And she's coming in and she is new and pushing kindly, but pushing for us to do this. And I'm like, no, not doing it online. I'm so tired of being online. People need to be in proximity. They need to be in person. And the truth is they do. That is true. And nothing beats in person. 
But I really felt like God was like, are you going to trust me with the people that I've brought to you to listen to them? And here's what makes a good leader. Here's what makes a good leader. Not when you're the smartest person in the room. That doesn't make a good leader. It's nice to be smart, but that's not what makes a good leader. A good leader knows the people's giftings of who they're leading and how to press into them and lean into them and hear from them for the betterment of the organization. That's a good leader. And I would even say in your home, a good parent is not being the smartest person, you know, the smartest person in your home. Understand the gifts of your children and your spouse and lean on them to receive from them for the betterment of your home. That's what makes a good leader. And to be honest, we're not even talking about leadership today, but this is just for free. So as what I desire is to be a good leader, I listened to Tori and here we go. This last weekend, we did the online academy. And let me tell you, I closed the screen on the third day, sobbing. I was crying as I was saying goodbye because it was so holy and so sacred. And some of it in ways were better than in person. There were things about the online that we couldn't get with the in-person. And then there's things with the in-person that we can't get with the online. And it was, it was unbelievable. You guys, it was unbelievable. Jesus transcends time, space, screens. He transcends it all. And people were held so beautifully. People were vulnerable. There was so much healing, so much transformation. You'll have to listen, you know, because I know people are going to be sharing some of their stories on our social media. If you go to freedom underscore movement, and follow uh, my organization there. We'll put that also in the show notes, but you can follow that organization there. You can see a bunch of their stories, but it was crazy. It was so crazy. And it was beautiful to see that people were like, man, I, I am tired. I'm tired of being stuck. I'm tired of not understanding how God works. And I am tired of, um, I'm just tired. I think that was the overall sense. I'm just tired. And most of everybody on here knew Jesus. So it's not like they don't have a concept of Jesus, but they really wanted to understand why they're doing what they're doing and why they're doing what they're doing when they don't really want to do it. Like they want to live for Jesus. They want to, they want to live for him. They want to do the things that God has called them to, but they still keep getting hung up in some of the behaviors and some of the, um, the attitudes and the thought processes. And they're like, I've been loving Jesus for years. Why does this keep happening? Why do I keep doing or thinking what I don't want to think and what I don't want to do? Why do I keep doing it? And that was such a beautiful question to ask. And curiosity within your story is always going to help bring invitation for the Holy Spirit to reveal revelation as to why you're doing what you're doing. As to the places of your heart that are still bound either to other people's sin that have sinned against you or your own sin or how you have begun to sin because of how you've been hurt in your story. It's, un, it's phenomenal. And just a little bit ago, I actually recorded um, a private uh, po- podcast for those of you that pre-order my book, Free and Fully Alive. Um, I just recorded, I kind of like pulled back the veil and shared my heart with you around why this book was written, some of the places that I didn't share in the story, uh, in the book that I didn't share. And um, share that with, with you. For those of you that pre-order the book, you'll get this podcast. You'll also get two videos. You'll get a video about being free and a video about what does it mean to be free and a video about what does it mean to actually live fully alive, breaking that down all different content than what's from the book. So you'll get like, you know, since the book won't come for a little bit till June 6th, um, you will get kind of the inside scoop and start actually diving into this content 
even before you get the book. So anyway, I just recorded this podcast um, about kind of the ins and outs. I read, you know, several portions from three different chapters of the book. And it just reminded me of, even as I read it, every time I look at it, why I wrote this and why I do Freedom Academy and why I do the trainings that I do, our Freedom and Story, our certificate program, why even freedom movement came into existence because of the very question that was asked this weekend. Why do I do what I do when I don't want to do it? It's such a great question, which leads us to scripture, right? Because there are things going on in our lives that are trauma informed, that there, our body is responding to trauma and to sin and to brokenness. And yet Jesus has something to say about this. In fact, Paul has something to say about this because Paul says this very question, which I love because it's Paul. It is Paul. And Paul is like the man. You know what I mean? Like he's, he is so good. <laughs> when I read about Paul, I'm like, I want to be Paul, but also because I've studied stories so much, I see and hear behind what Paul's saying. I see and hear his loneliness. I see his deep desire to be done and want to just go be with Jesus, but is so committed to the gospel that he will run the race with endurance, even though I think he is, would rather be with Jesus because he says so. I hear his grief over people and how he just always is trying to convince them like, please listen to me. Like there's a desperation in his voice that comes with deep grief and um, heartache. You know, Paul wasn't just running around like, yeah, it's all awesome. I mean, the guy was shipwrecked like three or four times. Like he was just, he was on the struggle bus. And I so appreciate that because most of the New Testament is written by Paul and it's all this like power, powerful statements. And yet he shows us his humanity. And I'm so thankful for it. In fact, he says here in Romans uh, chapter seven, verse 14, I'll read it uh, through. There's a few verses I'm going to read here. It says this, this is what Paul is saying. And he's saying this to the Romans, for we know that the law is spiritual, okay? But I am of the flesh, sold as a slave to sin, for I do not understand what I am doing because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Sound familiar? Now, I love this. It starts just getting so convoluted, like he's going back and forth. It's like he's sharing the craziness of his brain. And I so relate to this. Like when you're just kind of like in your head, like, what the heck's going on? I don't know why I'm doing this. And then I did this. And then I said this. And why did I say that? I don't want to say that. Why did I do that? Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. You know, you're just going all around in your brain. He's literally just letting us know what's going on in the craziness of his brain. And I love it. Verse 16. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do, for I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one that does it, but it is the sin that lives in me. So I discover the law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. For my inner self, I delight in God's law, but I see a different law in the parts of my body and it's waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. I am confused. I am, I'm just broken and messed up. Who will rescue me from the body of death? Thanks be to God, woo, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Okay. So what does this have to do with anything? And what does this have to do with us today? Essentially, what Paul is saying here is that he's at war. And he's, he, he has the power to overcome the war in his life, but he needs to take captive these thoughts that are in his mind. 
in Freedom Academy, there's a verse that in Freedom Movement as a whole, we love this verse. It's one of our anchor verses at Freedom Movement. Proverbs 20, verse 5. For a man's heart is like deep waters. It takes a, a man of great insight to draw it out. There are these places in our life, deep waters, deep, deep, deep waters in our story. These places that go, I call it in my book and free and fully alive. I call it the places that are not seen and not known, not seen by us and probably not even are not seen by others and probably not even known by us right? We have the top of our life that is seen by others. That's kind of the tip of the iceberg. It's seen by others. It's known by others. Then we even have this portion of our life. That's our, like our private life where we do stuff where we see, we, we see it, but it's not known by others. So it's seen by us, but not known by others. And then we have this portion of our life that is not seen by us and are not be seen by others and not even known by us. It's this place of deep waters. It's this place where Jesus wants to work and where he wants to heal, but it's also the same place where the enemy works and wants to keep us bound. It's the places of the deep waters of our story is where the confusion of why we do what we do comes from. You see our private life, the place where we're looking at, you know, pornography, or we are opting for, um, you know, wanting man six man's applause. And so we do all of these behaviors to try to get, uh, the applause of others. It's all of these places of behaviors where we will, you know, sacrifice rest so that we can be a servant. And really it's so that we can be seen as worthy. It's all of these places in our lives that are keeping us kind of functioning in this cycle of false freedom to try to be seen at the top level as good, worthy, holy people but they are driven, these actions and behaviors are driven by these deeper waters, these deeper places in our heart. And I love this scripture because Paul is essentially saying the very thing that we feel. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Now he does answer it. I'm doing what I don't want to do because I'm not acknowledging the places of my story and the sin in my story or the sin that's been done unto me that now I'm bound to that sin and it's creating behaviors that I don't even want to do, but I don't know how to stop them. Stopping a behavior without getting to the root of why you're doing that behavior will only lead you to a different behavior. Let me say that again. Stopping a behavior that you don't want to do without really understanding why you're doing that behavior will just move you to another behavior so that you don't have to deal with the pain of why you're doing the behavior in the first place. And what Paul is saying is like, look, there's a war that's being raged in my mind. The law, what he's referring to is the law helps give me guide rails on how to investigate and care for the places of my story. The law doesn't save me. Only Jesus's blood, death, burial, and resurrection is what saves me. The law helps me be more curious and have guardrails in how to take care of the deeper places of my heart that need tending to so that my behaviors are reflected from a place of wholeness rather than a place of brokenness. So here's my question for you. What are you doing in your life that you don't want to do? but you keep doing it anyway. And you feel shame around it. You feel condemnation around it. You have hatred for yourself around it. And even in that you've turned on others because it's easier to be angry at others than it is to actually sit and look at your own story and your own life. Where is it in your life where you do what you don't want to do? And you feel torn. You feel bound to these behaviors. You see, what Paul is saying is 
it is through Christ Jesus that with my, he says, with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin, the process of sanctification, which is, remember, I'm always going to say this, the process of being saved. You've not arrived. You didn't get saved the moment that you were justified. You were saved in that moment from hell, but you are in the process of being saved from the places of your story that still bear the mark of trauma, brokenness, sin, pain. And God's invitation is like, look, I I want to help heal these places of your flesh where they have kept you bound, but we have to go into these deeper places in your heart. Here's what I love about this scripture. Paul loves God. He knows Jesus very intimately. He, I mean, he wrote half of the the New Testament, if not more than half of the New Testament. This is a godly man. And he's letting us know, I have a lot of work to do. I have a lot of places in my story where I need to go into so that I can start doing what I actually want to do out of a place of wholeness and not being dictated by the place of my sin and my brokenness. And let me just give a caveat to this because oftentimes the places in our story more often than not, the places in our story, especially in the younger parts of our story, there are things that happen to us and we are now living out the effects of that, of our parents' woundedness that was not healed, that landed on us. And we just operated as a kid in a way to stay in belonging with them, like people pleasing or avoidance or even rage because rage at least allowed me to feel like I was alive. Whatever it is, uh, those actions helped us adapt as little kids, stay in uh, belonging. But as we've gotten older, I've said this before, it's moved into being a maladaptive behavior in our adult life. Maladaptive meaning it's no longer serving us well. It's actually causing hindrance to us. In fact, that survival technique that was there when we were little, our adaptive behavior has become a survival technique in our adulthood. But that survival technique is actually is actually hindering us from thriving. And this is what Paul's talking about. Paul is talking about these places that have gone unnamed and unchecked and unchallenged in our life, even though some of these places, a lot of these places have been done to us, they have an effect in our life. And that effect is their sin landed on us, created behaviors in us so that we didn't have to feel the weight of that sin in some fashion. And now we're living that survival technique, that behavior modification out in our own lives. So in essence, what God is inviting us into is to look at the places of our life, whether the sin that we have committed or the sins of our fathers and mothers that have landed on us or our forefathers and start looking and going, okay, who will save me from this place, these places of death? where I feel bound and trapped, we must thank, you know, thank God because God is committed to going into the depths of your story. So what is it that you do that you don't want to do where you feel bound? Like Paul says here, where he says that, where is it? It says here for, oh, 18, for I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh, but the desire to do good is also within me, but there's no ability to do it if I don't take a look at where evil has had its hand in my life. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. And I think this is where I just want you to know that, and it says here in 22, for my inner self, I do delight in God. 
And this is true of you. You actually delight in God and you want to do what God wants for your life, but you have been spoon fed religion and duty that keeps you from true processes of sanctification. Because when we opt for behaviors, the doing things of God, we actually are living in bondage to the law. The law was not there to condemn us. The law was not there to keep us with some kind of check check, you know, checking the box track record of how we're doing. The law was there, is there now to be a guidebook, a guide, like guardrails to help you allow the Holy Spirit to come in and bring processes of sanctification and to protect you from further temptation from God. I mean, from the enemy. So God created the law for this, but I think so many of us, even though we will say the law, you know, I no longer live under the law. I live under the grace of Christ Jesus. We operate in law like places. I got to go to church. I've got to, you know, which I think you need, do need to go to church. Uh, I've got to read my Bible. I, I do think you need to read your Bible. I, I need to um, be in a Bible study. I think that's really healthy. But we use those places as a means to actually heal our brokenness rather than surrendering and inviting God into the places of our hearts, the depths of the deep waters where sin has been rooted and narratives have begun for the flesh to kind of like spring up these behaviors, we, we opt for behavior modification rather than heart transformation. And so I was just thinking about this because as I watched this last weekend of Freedom Academy and watching these people have to take a hard look at their life, the first day is so difficult and you would think it really wouldn't be because really we're just naming, here's what your story looks like. Here's what it was intended. Here's all the places that have moved you. You know, here's all the things that move you towards this kind of cycle of false freedom, these places of behavior modification, where you just do behavior after behavior to try to mitigate or avoid the pain of your story. You would think that in your head, like, yeah, I get that. But here's what I see time and time again, that when people come to Freedom Academy or sit with me in story work or whatever, they realize I've actually not been given permission to name these places that feel really, really bound. And to be honest with you, I didn't even really know they were there and I didn't really know where to begin. And this is what I want to ask you. This is why I keep asking you, what do you do that you don't want to do? You know you don't want to do it and you keep doing it. The question to ask yourself is, what is it helping protect you from? Because we don't do anything that doesn't have a payoff. We don't do anything. Drugs had a payoff for me. It allowed me to numb the places of my heart and my story that I didn't have to, so I didn't have to feel the pain. Ministry then, after I got off drugs, became my addiction and I was addicted to ministry. And there was a payoff for ministry, especially ministry not being the place where God was really present. It was more my desire to have applause from others and have accolade because one, I wanted to not feel the shame of my addiction from drugs, but two, the applaud of all of you made me feel better. And so there was a payoff. There is a payoff when we are committed to doing sinful behaviors. There's a payoff. And the payoff, we always will do things that have a payoff for us. The problem is, is the payoff is instant gratification, instant relief, but the lasting results of it is more shame, more of doing what we don't want to do, keeping us bound. So we have to continue this cycle of false freedom into these 
behaviors from one behavior to the next, whether it's ministry, religion, you know, uh, buying clothes, you know, uh, drugs, pornography, pills, uh, success, money, just whatever. And we continue doing what we don't want to do, even though we know we don't want to do it. And this is my invitation to you. Sometimes we do it because it's how we survived when we were young. It was an adaptive behavior that has now become maladaptive and it moves us into these different behaviors. And I think the invitation is God is saying, look, I gave you the law to help give you guardrails, but we got to get honest with the places of your story and invite me into them so that I can do the supernatural exchange. I am so thankful to Paul because if we really read scripture, like truly through the lens of Paul being human, because he was fully human, not, he was not God. Jesus was fully man, fully God. And even he shows us all of the places of his own humanity. I don't want to have to do this. Is there a different way? Love that scripture (laughs) because I feel that. But here, Paul, is just an ordinary, everyday human, you guys, who was sold out for Jesus because he had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. It changed the trajectory of his life. He went away for three years while Jesus began to do the deep work of healing the parts of his story, especially from the story of where he was younger, of course. Now, it doesn't tell us all that happened in scripture, but we know in our own life that we can't just come to know Jesus and all of a sudden we just you know, everything that affected us in our life was just gone. It just doesn't happen that way. It does not work that way. And I believe truly that's why Paul had to go away for three years and deal with his story and all the crap he was having to deal with growing up in religion. And Jesus needed to really go into the depths of those places And yet, even after all these years of walking with Jesus, he writes in Romans, I still do what I don't want to do, even when I know it's the wrong thing. Help me, Jesus. This should be so encouraging for you that God is not asking you to arrive. He's asking you for your honesty. He's not asking for you to toughen up. He's asking for you to open up. This is what God is asking you to do. Because it's here with the guardrails of the law that just say, hey, you know, don't murder. It's not going to be good for you. Hell, oh, by the way, serve one God because that is the true way. Oh yeah, by the way, love your neighbor as yourself because it's going to help you get out of your own story. Oh yeah, by the way, rest in Sabbath because it's actually going to bring life and goodness to your body. You know, these are all guardrails. These are all to help you move in your story. And this is good. What Paul is talking about here is not so much the law. He's talking about the invitation for God to enter into the places of his heart that are still bound to sin, to the story of his past, to continue, help me, God. For there are places in my heart that are still dead that need to come to life. This should be so encouraging for you, friend, that you have not been asked to to just kill it for the kingdom. Barf. Just so much barf behind that sentence. What you've been asked to do, be like Paul. Serve God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Love your enemy as your, love your neighbor as yourself and also pray for your enemies, but allow Jesus, because this is where Paul is so personal, that there is a war that he meet, that he speaks of that is waging war in his body. He doesn't deny it. He doesn't cover it up. He, he doesn't act holier than thou. No, he writes it for all eternity, for all of us until the day of Jesus. We get to read about the words of Paul that says, I do what I don't want to do when I don't want to do it. 
And I know that God is at work within me and I desire him. I love him, but I also know that there is evil working its way in my life. Help me. He says, who will rescue me? Jesus. And it's not going to be Jesus through all of his activity because Paul is doing plenty of activity. He's following the law. He's honoring the guardrails and still he struggles and still he struggles. I don't know about you, but man, this just makes me go, thank you, Jesus, for a Bible full of a bunch of misfits, a bunch of broken men and women, and one good God who wants to meet us in every part of us, who wants to slowly tend to the places of our mind and our bodies that are still bound. And he wants that desire to grow and grow and grow for God's kingdom to bring holy and goodness to the land of the living. It is so encouraging because he's not asking you to be perfect. He's not asking you to toughen up. He's just asking you to be honest to name it, to invite him into it, and to discover the places in your own life where God wants to bring healing and hope and fullness. I think Paul is living fully alive, fully alive by this one portion of scripture because he is naming what it means to be fully human and to allow the deity of God and his image bearer person to hold both of those places. You see, fully alive, I'll say it time and time again, is not the absence of one thing over the other. It is the presence of both. There's desire that lives inside me, and there's also evil that wages war within my same body. Jesus, help me. You're awakened to life. You aren't minimizing it or bypassing it. You're awakened to it. And it is here by the fullness and the truth of your fully alive life that Jesus can do his best work, beginning to heal, beginning to sanctify, continuing the process of you becoming more like Jesus. Amen. So good. I'm so thankful for this passage. So I encourage you go sit Read Romans 7, it's 14 through 25, I think, 14 through 25, yep. And just sit and meditate on that this week. Uh, I'll be on next week and we're going to talk a little bit more. We're going to be diving a lot into a life that is free and fully alive this month because I want to start breaking that down. We're going to bring on some various speakers uh, to to talk about it. We've got Tony Collier coming on. We've got Lisa Whittle coming on, Kate uh, Tomlin coming on with some amazing people coming on uh, where we're going to talk to them about what does it mean for them to live fully alive in their life? And what does that look like? How has that been hard for them? So we're going to bring them on to talk about that. But I want you to start being curious about your own life as we dive in this month um, around this topic of what does it mean to live free and fully alive in your life? Uh, It's a good place to begin. It's really a good place to be curious about because we all want abundance. We all want to live fully alive. So I just encourage you to kind of be thinking about that this week. Uh, I would love for you, if you uh, would be so gracious and so kind, uh, is to order, pre-order, free and fully alive. Uh, that With that pre-order comes the two videos. Like I said, uh, what does it look like to be free? How can we live a fully alive life? That's all content that is a not in the book. And a special podcast just made for all of those that pre-ordered. Um, really pulling back the veil, sharing a little bit of my heart behind why I wrote this and some of the stories that didn't, that aren't in the book. And um, with that all comes with your pre-order. So you can start diving into this topic uh, even more um, with this. And that is just for our pre-order. So it would mean so much if you pre-ordered that uh, free and fully alive, you can get that on Amazon. We'll put that in the show notes. And it's really, the truth is reclaiming the story of who God created you to be. So Thank you guys so much. It is so awesome to be with all of you. I have just gotten a new like wind, if you will, around this podcast. I don't know. Maybe God is just like 
he's just given me a passion for it just to talk with you guys and share with you um, about scripture, um, about being filled with the spirit and really about being trauma informed in our lives. So I am so excited for the journey where the honest pod is going to be taking us. I'd love for you to subscribe and review and share with your friends. Guys, thank you so much. May you get curious about the places of your life where you do what you don't want to do and you do it anyway, not for condemnation, not for shame, but for curiosity, invitation, and ultimately restoration in those places. We'll talk to you next week.